cultural, academic, social, political, and thought leaders of our state. KTAR News on 92.3 FM and KTAR.com. World Class Arizona with Pat McMahon. Oh, I love it when I can say at the beginning of this that the weekend is simply looking up already because it's the first time this group, this Hall of Fame group has ever been together on this program. They've been here individually, but never together. I want you to call the children in from play. I want them to hear this program because uh, the McMahon group today consists of a semi-regular uh, on the program, and he is... Zudi Jasser. I'm a physician, uh, internal medicine, private practice, but I also uh, am president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, based here in Phoenix. So we know where this is going to go, don't we, Zudi? <laughs> yes. I'm sure you'll uh, take it into the land of interfaith uh, debates. But this is more fun than when you appear before Congress, as you regularly do. Absolutely. There's no tougher... Uh, interviewing uh, cross-examination than that from Pat McMahon. Oh, I thought you were going to say from one of the guys from Georgia. Uh, but no, when you when you sit down in front of a congressional uh, committee, you know every single individual person there has an axe to grind. Oh, yeah. They come in already with th their minds made up, don't they? They do. That's a sad thing. It's rarely, uh, unfortunately, focused on the issues that we're there to talk about. It's often about how to use it as wedge issues or partisan, uh, to widen the partisan divide so that they can use it at home to uh, uh, rally the masses. And we should acknowledge that Dr. Jasser spent 11 years in the United States Navy as a naval officer and uh, served his country well. I thank you so much for that and for being here today. Now, thank listen, you. talking before a congressional committee, nothing compared with talking before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is actually very easy to talk before. It's like a seminar. Uh, it's relaxed. It's informal. They won't let you make a speech. So it's basically answering questions. It's a lot of fun. But you know, now, uh, having not introduced yourself, they think this is Grant Woods talking now. They have no idea. Well, what can I do about that? You can introduce yourself. Paul Bender. I teach constitutional law at ASU Law School. Uh, a, a dean of I was that a dean, school. yeah. You don't have to remind me of that. Well, that let, was... me, let me remind everybody, though, what we're talking about when it comes to credits. Because I'm not a big fan of, of name dropping. But I will tell you this. When you're talking about the kind of background that you have had, and you have been in the company of uh, Learned Hand, right. Right. Felix Frankfurter, right. Thurgood Marshall. Right. I worked for it, all of them. I, I mean, don't you ever, I mean, even at this point in your career, in your life, don't you ever look back and say, for crying out loud. How was I lucky enough to do all those things? But I mean, we're talking about superstars. Absolutely. Yeah, no, learned hand was, most people think, probably the best judge who ever was on an American court. He never was on the Supreme Court, probably because he was that good that it was hard to get through the political process. Felix Frankfurt was a leading figure in American education, constitutional law, and Thurgood Marshall. Everybody knows who he was. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, very interesting to be able to do that. I just always thought that Leonard Hand didn't make it to the Supreme Court because the Senate didn't want to even talk to him. Uh, but, <laughs> oh, no, that's these days. Well, we'll talk about that. And, and here, back after a long absence, uh, one of my favorite MD guys. Introduce yourself, please, once again to the audience. Thank you, Pat. I'm uh, Dr. Ted Dietrich. Uh, I've been here for about 30-some years. I started the Arizona Heart Institute, the Foundation, and the Translational Research Center there, and that's where I'm focusing my attention now. Explain why it is that you called your latest book, your your autobiography, SLED. It has nothing to do with Orson Welles or Citizen Kane, right? <laughs> no, no, it has nothing to do with that. It's... Um, uh, Sled is a story of a five-year-old, seven-year-old boy on Christmas Day. Uh, he got his new flexible flyer sled, and he invited his uncle, uh, they were in Michigan, to take a sled ride. Uh, and during the sled ride, they were racing in a big, big storm the night before, and they came up to the railroad track, and the, the sled flipped, and the little boy fell in the snowbank, and all snow and ice all over him. 
and his uncle came up to him to be sure he was okay. And the boy says, Uncle Ken, I wasn't made for play. I was made for work. <laughs> so this is the story. That's my story. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to saying some of those things that a kid that age might say coming out of a snowbank. Right. Uh, I don't know whether, in fact, as a child, uh, you aspired to what you have become a pioneer in medical research, cardiovascular surgeon, inventor, uh, author, on the cover of Life magazine, musician in college. Is there anything, I've never asked you this in all the years I've known you, is there anything that you discovered you were really lousy at? Uh, yes, Pat, I, I couldn't spell worth anything. A terrible speller. Uh, and when I wrote this book, I wrote this book actually on on eight and a half by eleven paper with a Tangaroga black pen, uh, and then I had to give it to the secretary. I give them credit in the book because uh, I couldn't even read my own writing, in particular my own spelling. So that's one of my real deficiencies. I'm just sitting here thinking about the people who are driving by on a weekend, listening to this broadcast, saying. I really ought to call my attorney about that prescription uh, that, that Dr. Dietrich wrote to me many years ago. He might have misspelled the, <laughs> the whole medication. I've been taking the wrong thing all this time. We've got a lot of medical talk uh, to talk about. We've got a lot of news talk, a lot of legal talk, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of talk about what's going on internationally uh, when it comes to the world of Islam. Uh, and all of this... On KTAR News 92.3 FM, it is the McMahon Group with Dr. Edward Ted Dietrich, Professor Paul Bender, and Dr. Zudi Jasser. And by the way, since we do have Dr. Bender here, I think the least we can do is get all of the decisions that the Supreme Court not been able to make so far because they're tied on everything. Yeah, very few of those, actually. But, for, yeah, but it makes for a nice transition. Yeah, no, I understand. I thought you were going to say you want to know how they're going to decide the cases they haven't yet decided. No, I want you to that... decide then because we have just made you. Oh, okay, that's fine. The deciding uh, member of the Supreme Court. You want me to do what Scalia would have done? <laughs> or can I do what I want to do? Uh, I'll tell you what, since you know what, we've got about 45 minutes left. You can do anything <laughs> okay. you want to, as Paul Bender generally has done, as dean of the ASU Law School, and now a professor there, and a sun devil throughout. This is Pat McMahon. The Voice of Arizona, KTAR News on 92.3 FM and the KTAR app. Here's more world-class Arizona with Pat McMahon. And with Dr. Ted Dietrich, Arizona Heart Institute founder, and <laughs> so many other things. So many other things that we don't have time, because we've only got 45 minutes left uh, on the McMahon Group. Professor Paul Bender is here. Dr. Zudi Jasser is here. Uh, and that is the McMahon Group for this weekend. Um, Professor Bender, yep. Supreme Court, four and four. Right. Nobody thinks that's a good idea. Yeah, it's not as bad an idea, though, as most people think. Okay, because sorry. Because very few cases will have their result changed because they're four to four, because they're only eight justices rather than nine. The only cases that are going to change are cases where Scalia would have been part of a five-justice majority. So there might be ten cases in the whole term that might be affected by, uh, by Scalia's not being there. It's not that they can't do any work at all. And they have a way of dealing with that. If, uh, if they split four to four and it's an important case they want to decide, they can just put the case over to the next term and hear it again. Or they can, if they split four to four, that's a, an, an affirmance without an opinion. So it's just as if they didn't take the case. They leave things the way they are. So it's Stops, uh, it stops the court maybe from doing a few things, but it's not a major interruption of their ability to do their work. But the people who are affected by those decisions, yeah, they but have the to only, wait. Yet. You, well, the, if the court puts cases over, they would have to wait. I don't think the court's going to do that a lot, mainly because they don't know when they're going to get a ninth justice. They may not get a ninth justice until the end of the next term. There's not going to be a new justice confirmed until after the presidential election. Okay, what, do you, what do you think of that? I mean, here you have been, we talked about Thurgood Marshall and Felix Frankfurter. You've worked with the best of them. And now the Senate 
to me, Republican or Democratic Senate, says brazenly, tough. We're, we're not even going to address this until that, after the That year. was outrageous. I mean, they should wait at least to hear who the nominee is. I can understand turning the nominee down if you think the nominee is not, uh, is not capable of being on the court. In fact, the nominee is exactly the kind of person that both Republicans and Democrats should want to have on the court. He is a moderate. He is somebody who gets along with everybody. He's very smart, and he might begin to bring the court back together in a way that people thought John Roberts would would but hasn't that is to be in the middle of the court and and be somebody who people can agree with from both sides so it's it, it, to say in advance that we don't care who you're going to nominate we're not going to even listen to them that's just not proper is it legal yeah it's legal Congress can do basically anything it wants like that they don't have to do anything uh, so there's no way to force them to uh, to consider it uh, but it's a really 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 bad idea and what really makes it bad from a marketing standpoint, just public relations alone, yeah. is that some of the Republicans, in this case, some of those Republican senators had in the past already oh, they, yeah, he was given confirmed. this man yeah. such yeah. approval. With good reason. Uh, so, and I think Obama really gave it to them because what he did was nominate somebody who they all ought to be for, and they've already announced that they're going to be against him, or they're not going to listen to him, and so it makes them look really bad. So, looking bad, uh, as so many people in high office do these days, <laughs> uh, is this a dangerous time for America? Because of the lack of faith oh, yeah. that the citizens have in their leadership. Yeah. yeah, for that reason. And because the leadership is so interested, a lot of them, maybe most of them, in political considerations rather than trying to do the right thing. I mean, politics has now become everything. Uh, yeah, it's a dangerous time. We have to get out of that. How? By having a leader emerge who uh, a majority of people in the country can have faith in and can believe in and have confidence in. There was a hope Obama would be that, but it didn't turn out that way. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be anybody on the horizon who's going to do that, but it's not going to happen, I don't think, until that happens. Yeah, nobody, including the candidates. Including the candidates, right. I mean, you have candidates who, all of them now, have a higher percentage of unfavorable opinion than favorable. I mean, what's going on? Professor, not, you know, I don't mean to jump in here. I know, you're outnumbered. Judy I, I know you're outnumbered by doctors here, but as a citizen, I would say, I mean, if you look at the history, though, in the last hundred years, an appointment in the last year of a, of a two-term presidency is, is a, a very unusual thing. So, uh, you know, the, I think for a lifetime appointment, there's, I, I think it's unfair to label that as political and lump in all the other political divisiveness when, in fact, you have an appointment that's being made within you know, it won't actually be finalized until a few months before the presidency is completed. So if you look at the last hundred years, I don't think that, that that's purely a political thing. I don't know how many times it's happened, but the most important person on the Supreme Court today, Justice Kennedy, was confirmed in the last year of a two-term president. Ronald Reagan. And he's proven to be actually the least um, ideologically predictable right. Supreme Court well, justice. So that's exactly who you want on the court. Okay. Well, let's talk about something other than being a Republican or a Democrat. Zudi Jasser, is this the worst time ever in your lifetime or in modern times? Is this the worst time to be a Muslim in America? Uh, I don't think so. I think, you know, with all challenges comes a sense of uh, learning and growth and maturity and a time for maturation. The question is, where is Islam today in its history? I think Islam is in the same time in history that Christianity was when it was fighting theocracy and America came was born from that battle. So I think, you know, if, if Muslims continue to, yes, it's a lot of pressure. Our children are growing in an environment where both sides of the political equation are are uh, basically uh, using Muslims for a wedge issue rather than actually figuring out how the three to four million Muslims in America can shape the planet of a quarter of the world's population. That's where we should be looking, but unfortunately both sides are providing no solutions and not looking really where is Islam today in history in its battle against theocracy. All right. You are well known nationally, internationally as a moderate activist representing Islam and you know I've told you in the past I really like you I like you as a friend I like you as a doctor I like you as a guest 
But I'm getting sick of seeing it. <laughs> uh, because to tell you the truth, when we look in our huge guest book for, oh, let's find a moderate voice in the world of Islam, you keep coming up. So where are the rest of the folks? Here in Arizona or in Delaware or nationally or internationally? Well, I, I think we're we're well beyond where we were 10, 12 years ago when you and I first met after uh, 9-11 and, and uh, started a, along this path. Uh, I think that, you know, our Muslim reform movement, uh, if you go to that website, muslimreformmovement.org, you'll see 15, 20 different uh, Muslim leaders in the U.S., Canada, and Europe that are pushing the envelope of reform against political Islam, against the establishment of our faith right now, which is the problem. So, yes, we have a major leadership problem in our faith community, but the grassroots have either been apathetic, they've been fearful they sometimes are ill-equipped to deal with all of this you know political environment if you will uh, we are still very young in our uh, immigration if you will into the west and into into america so you know most of our families are new immigrants and you know as as a second generation american muslim this is one of the reasons i'm doing this is i think we have a responsibility to lead the reform and representation of new ideas okay i have less than a minute what would mohammed say about terrorism I think that that's actually the best question I've ever been asked because people try, you know, Muslims try to say, well, what did Muhammad do in the 7th century? That's not relevant. What would Muhammad do in the 21st century? And I think he would say terrorism is not the problem. That's a symptom. The problem is the theocratic state of Islamism, the Islamic state not only of ISIS, of Saudi Arabia, of Iran, all of these cauldrons of radicalism. Muslims need to look within the house of Islam. And I would say Muhammad would remind Muslims of what's in the Quran where it says, Call out for justice, even against your own family, if it's the right thing to do. And that's what we're not doing. We're blaming the Jews. We're blaming the West. We're, we're not taking responsibility. Instead, I think the Prophet Muhammad would tell us to look inside. Boy, if you thought my question was good, how about that answer? Huh? Uh, because, you know, we don't get the junior varsity here uh, on this program. Uh, are you kidding at the prices that we have to pay these people to come in? <laughs> and, and the chuckles, of course, come from the guests who know they didn't even get gas money. But they may get gas in the next half hour. Uh, because this is the McMahon Group, and you never know what's coming up. But I will tell you one of the things that we are going to be talking about, and that is... The practice of medicine, we've got two doctors and a professor. I'll bet they have opinions, and they will express them on KTAR News 92.3 FM. Big man. Uh, we're talking law, we're talking Islam, we're talking about sleds. The serendipitous life of Edward B. Dietrich, Ted Dietrich. And you still don't mind when people call you. After all you've accomplished in the world of medicine, you don't even insist that people call you doctor, do you? I, I think it's a compliment. That people call you Ted, yes. It is. It is. Well, I'll tell you what, then, Ted. Okay. Tell me what's wrong with medicine in America. Tell me what you would most want to change in the whole field of, of medicine, which we include attorneys, right, court. Um, insurance companies, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, anything at all in that field or anything else that you'd like to choose? Pat, the thing that disturbs me the most about medicine today is that the focus of medicine is no longer taking care of the patient and being sure that all the needs of the patient are taken care of to reduce the suffering, death, adverse events, and so forth. And until that focus changes, and we get rid of all those other problems like the insurance companies and like the Medicare and all that, until we reorient the focus so it comes back on the patient, we're not going to solve this. Who's going to do that? The AMA? No, no, no. It'll never be the, it, it should be. It should be the physicians. But the problem is the physicians, are, they're in conflict. I mean, we, I could ask Zudi, I bet he would agree that we're in conflict with, with, the, with the environment we're in. But we need to get out of that. We need to get back into an orientation that when you wake up in the morning, the most important thing in your life as a doctor is to take care of that patient and get them as well as you can. Where's the conflict? The conflict is the reimbursement. The conflict is... 
<laughs> How do I get paid? And this is getting worse and worse and worse now. So you when know, you wake up in the morning, the most important thing is... How am I going to get paid for what I'm doing? No, that, that I mean, unfortunately, now, yeah. that's what's happening. Yeah, that's what it is. And it's getting worse now because, the, look, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, health care, whatever it won in the paper yesterday. Yeah, um, they're pulling they're, out. They're going to go out, yeah. Uh, and that has to be changed. It, it, you know, it needs to get back to where it was when I wrote this book. So anyways, you were talking. I was thinking about my career. You know, I... I had a very great experience in Amman, Jordan. I opened, I inaugurated the King Hussein Medical Center. Mm. Um, I started training programs over there. I operated many, many times on the Prince's family. I started the educational program here for our nurse specialists. And two of the most important nurse specialists I brought were two nurses from Amman, Jordan. And I'm wondering if some of this in the future in the way you, I know you're going to go the government route and so forth, but I think in just the educational things we can do, and I tell you for sure the research things, and I've got those, those things I'm doing now, but in our school of ultrasound at the, at the foundation, if we were to offer to any of the people over in that area, and not only offer, but make, make a situation attainable to them so they would have housing like we provided, uh, they would have the transportation and so forth. When those people are trained here and they see how we're practicing medicine here when, it's, when we're doing well, I'm not so proud of it all the time now. But I think that it does, a, I can tell you it does a great thing because I'm getting, as people are reading this book, I'm getting emails and faxes from around the world all the time and many from the, from the Middle East saying, Ted, it was wonderful to have you here. Uh, our, our nurses are doing great, and we, we look forward to more help. So I would put, um, in my priority, I would put education uh, for these people in the other countries and see how we can expedite that. All, All right. right, but we still continue to carry on with the title, America, Home of the Best medicine available in the world the highest level of medicine and i'm asking who decided that because the statistics when it comes to infant mortality uh, when it comes to a number of other statistics doesn't it doesn't bear that out we have probably the best educated uh, medical professionals and we certainly have the best machinery have the best equipment but zuti uh, so hold on a sec. Those statistics are very unfair. I mean, I have to tell you, by the way, it's, it's an honor to be on a panel with Dr. Dietrich. My father is a cardiologist, a contemporary of Dr. Dietrich's in town when I came in, and he's an icon. And, and I have to tell you, your success is testimony to the product of free market, of the, of the success of individuals who are able to dream and, and accomplish what they can based on economics, based on the doctor-patient relationship, because right now the doctor-patient relationship is intervened by 30 other people in the exam room that includes insurance companies, government, um, billers, all the other folks that intervene between us and the, and the patient. You use those those are societies, uh, countries like Sweden and others that don't have the distribution of, of income that we do in America, don't have the populations that we do. Anything that gets socialized and gets controlled, you're taking a, a medicine. And by the way, 90-some percent of innovation in the planet on medicine starts in America and has happened here. That's going to create an average mediocritization of America through socialization of medicine and I think any socialized system ends up making you might move the mean up and, and average healthcare might improve but the ends the innovation the research will disappear over the next 10 years as the best and brightest don't go into medicine they'll go into other things because they Ted was able to dream as a child to do things that my kids are not able to dream of in medicine today well, what do you do about the fact that so many people in this country don't have access to adequate medical care so the question is, how do you do, so when you say something's a right, you're not talking about welfare rights, or you're talking about constitutional rights. Welfare rights, I think, can be provided based on systems that are stimulated either through tax credits, through um, bringing the, the lowest in society up to give them. I'm not saying you shouldn't have any free health care. You need to provide that for the lowest in society. But others, there needs to be stimulus that they, you know, United walked out of the insurance exchange system today because it wasn't working for them. You know, so the bottom line is, is you can't 
you know, fabricate money. It has to come from somewhere to care for these yeah, folks. Yeah, but when I look at that, I, it seems to me that it's the profit motive that's hurting the medical care system. I mean, they dropped out because they couldn't make so enough what's money. The, the first thing doctors think of when they get up in the morning is, where is my money coming from? Okay, but what's from? the most important thing we do? We eat, right? Well, Have I we ever thought about that. nationalizing hey, grocery Paul, stores? Wrong. I disagree with that. That you know, was your statement, the first thing. I say you think about the patient. How you should sure. think about the patient. But that, but what do they do now? Corrected. Oh, no, that's, I'm, I'm that's, sorry. That's about what it, I said. I just, yeah, that's okay. what they should be doing. Yeah. But okay. right now they're Good. worried about making money. Yeah. But and you yeah. have a system right now where you could graduate first in your class or last in your class, and you get paid the same for every patient. When patients come, lawyers in your profession can charge 500 bucks an hour or 100 bucks an hour. We have no elasticity of price in the healthcare system, which creates a mediocre system. And why is that that you have no elasticity of price? Because of government control of, of prices from Medicare and Medicaid that then every other insurance company controls, so that if I spend 10 minutes or 30 minutes with a patient, I get paid the same. Dr. Ted Dietrich, I've got a minute. Uh, and the consequence of that is, uh, Zudi, I was going to raise my hand even before I got the, the opportunity here. The consequence is what Zudi was saying. The superstars, the brightest and the, those who should be leading the way, I'm talking about medicine, nursing, everything in, that we're dealing with, they are not being energized and they're not being given the opportunities. And you, you know what really is happening? You've heard about this business about the companies are all moving to Ireland. Um, sure. Well, that is actually happening. And do you know what that means to us? That means we don't have the latest equipment. We don't have the latest products. I can, I can tolerate that. But we don't have the opportunity to train our best and our brightest in the latest technologies that are available someplace else. That's sad. Zudi Jasser, uh, you were talking about uh, medical care being available for free for the lowest uh, level of the economic ladder. I am that person. If I go to a hospital and have a major surgery and I'm not covered by insurance for whatever reason, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know how anybody can afford to be sick in America. Well, we'll talk about that when we get back on the McMahon Group. This is KTAR News, 92.3 FM. And you notice we've been talking only about the people who are in medicine waking up in the morning saying, where do I get my paycheck? Never once has the attorney been mentioned. We may. This is Pat McMahon. KTAR News on 92.3 FM. The voice of Arizona. KTAR News on 92.3 FM and the KTAR app. Here's more world-class Arizona with Pat McMahon. And Dr. Zudi Jasser and Professor Paul Bender, Dr. Ted Dietrich. What an all-star group this is. Paul Bender, mm -hmm. Supreme Court of the United States and immigration. Let's talk about that. Re re respond, if you will, about what it is that's going on in the halls now of, of the, the Supreme of Court. The court. Yeah, they heard a case on Monday, which was a a challenge to President Obama's plan to uh, s make a plan not to deport people who had been here for, I think it was at least five years, who have children uh, who are American citizens and people have not committed any crimes and have a stable life here, that he announced that he was not going to deport those people and instead use his resources to deport people who had committed crimes or people who had recently been here. And that was challenged by, I think, 25 states. And the court on Monday heard argument about whether that program was constitutional or not. Uh, and most of the argument was devoted to the question, this is going to sound very technical, but it's important, of whether those states had standing to sue to challenge the president's program because there's no immediate impact upon the states. All the president is doing is saying to a bunch of people, I'm not going to deport you. Uh, and the question is whether the states have the, the right to challenge that. Uh, and the court's going to be very closely divided on that issue. I think the court is probably going to decide that the states do not have uh, standing to do that and that the lawsuit would be dismissed and the program can go forward because the states really don't have any immediate uh, in negative impact on them from the president doing it. Those people are here. They're going to be here anyway. Uh, and so whether the program goes forward or not does not have a negative impact upon the states. There was another decision that was made uh, regarding a totally different uh, issue, uh, but one that I find to be terribly confusing, 
But then again, I didn't go to law school. That's why I'm asking you, if I'm a transgender and I got to go to the bathroom, what do I do, Paul? Well, it depends on where you are, what the state law is. That issue has not come to the Supreme Court yet. No, it probably hasn't come will to the Supreme someday. Court, yeah. but there have been some decisions yeah. on lower courts just in the past week uh, that affect uh, North Carolina, affect Mississippi. Yes, yeah, some states are trying to say that transgender people have to use the bathroom uh, that their birth certificate would indicate they have to use, even though they've gone through a procedure uh, to transgender themselves into being another gender. Uh, I think that is very constitutionally suspect and will probably end up being struck down to force people to be something that they don't want to be and in many cases are not anymore uh, seems to me to be unconstitutional. And you were considered an authority uh, in the field of not only civil rights, but also sex discrimination. Are we entering into an area that the Supreme Court just simply won't hear? I think they'll have to hear that eventually if the states persist in doing that. Well, all I can tell you is, is that uh, whether it's a matter of race or religion uh, or gender, we certainly live in a period of time uh, that our parents probably did not foresee. Yeah, yeah, that's probably always going to be true. When you talk about, though, the, uh, the Supreme Court and the decisions that are being made, the Supreme Court have anything to do? No, let's just say any court. Any court would have anything to say about how the next, uh, the, the next uh, election is going to be run. I mean, the one in November? Yeah, the one in November. Because, I mean, it's all of this business about uh, the rules are set up uh, to uh, be discriminatory toward me, and uh, uh, these are bogus rules. It's not the democratic way to do it. You're talking about the party rules. Yeah. I, that's not something that will come to the court. That's internal party affairs. And it so they can do mean, anything they yeah, want to do? Yeah, basically they can, yeah. yeah. If they excluded black people from voting, uh, then the court has in the past stepped in. But whether or not they have committed delegates or, or delegates who can make up their mind once they get to convention, that's not the, nothing for the Supreme Court. That's a party matter. I've asked Dr. Jasser to change everything in the Middle East, so that there will be peace in our time. So I'm going to be asking you something that may be just as tough, and that is, do we really need the Electoral College, or would Bender toss it out? It would be better to get to find a way to get, to get rid of it, so that elections uh, depend upon how many people vote for the candidate rather than the states that they live in, and it would also affect the way uh, uh, the way campaigns are run because it 's really important to win some states which have a lot of electoral votes and you just can ignore other states that don 't have many electoral votes. It would be better if you had national campaigns that appeal to everybody, but it 's not easy to see how to work that out because who 's going to run a national popular election system you have to have a whole machinery to do that. So, uh, so, the Electoral College is not a good idea. Dr. So, Dr. Yes. Bender, that's not the position of the Federalist Society, though. Um, I don't know what they think about the election. So, I mean, the federal, you know, federal systems are set up to not disenfranchise states that, that are not California or New York or, or Chicago. Well, um, so at the end of the day, if you have it based on population only, you actually defederalize our system. And you, you actually then create a central party authority that will only cater to large cities and large metropolitan areas. No, I don't think that's true. It caters to large uh, collections of people, but they don't have to be in the same state. I mean, if, if you have a bunch of people throughout the country who are, have an interest and they're a large group, they'll be catered to by the candidates, no matter where they live. Well, I guess my contrarian opinion is that, you know, having worked with a lot of populations in the Middle East that are looking at setting up new systems of democracy, one of the problems with Egyptian democracy when, it, when they had their Arab awakening was that it became a majoritocracy. And one of the successes of American freedom has been that we are not a democracy or we are a republic. So as a result, we have a constitution based in protection of minorities and minority rights. And I think the, the end of the electoral college and the end of a federal system will begin the end of, down a slippery slope towards a majoritocracy rather than a republic. Well, one word about the electoral college of the federal system and our democracy. In the Senate of the United States, you have a majority of the senators representing about a quarter of the population. That's not democracy.
And that's a big problem in this country today. And in the House of Representatives, you have a House that's dominantly Republican, and yet in the last uh, re election for the House, I think two more, two million more people voted for Democratic candidates than for Republican candidates. And yet Republicans have a big majority in the House. This is not a Democrat or Republican thing, but that's not democracy. And uh, uh, the federal system is responsible for that. By the way, the signal that you just heard uh, was not a heart monitor uh, of mine. Uh, it was... <clears throat> An unusual piece of technology that Dr. Dietrich brought into the studio that said, you haven't mentioned my book in the last half hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's absolutely remarkable what those people from Amazon can do anymore. And the can't, Apple can't people, <laughs> uh, all right, the serendipitous life of Edward Dietrich. And no, you didn't insist that I mention it, but I want to. Because it isn't just a book for families that have medical students uh, in the uh, in the group. It's really something for everybody. Um, the the reason I like this book is not because I wrote it, but the things we're talking about today uh, incorporate medicine a lot. But this book is a philosophy of life, and it's the philosophy of my life as a physician and how I address. These issues that we're talking about, that's why they bring the Middle East in here, are teaching the Middle East and that sort of thing. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a philosophy book for the young person to look at and maybe, maybe pattern some things. I wouldn't pattern everything. Some things I, I didn't do well, but pattern some out after my life. I want you to explain something to me that I don't know I've ever asked you before, but some time ago, the Super Ted days, the Life magazine cover days. You had an awful lot of other cardiologists that couldn't stand you. Now, now you know that. That's no surprise to you. But I know that because I would run into somebody and I would say, Oh, you know what? Ted Dietrich's a friend of ours. And he, oh, really? Super Ted? Yeah. That kind of professional jealousy would seem to me would get in the way of the practice of medicine. Uh, Pat, there is an entire chapter in this book called The Medical Mafia. Uh, and it's probably it's the most exciting mafia. thing you ever heard. That's why uh, I brought it up. <laughs> thanks for bringing it up. In fact, we did a podcast on this just last week. Uh, and it's it, absolutely amazing. It's amazing. Listen, if any of you have podcasts coming up, by the way, please know you can call here and always appear on this program. Uh, hey, look, before this... Before this hour is out, and I've got about a minute and a half, right? Okay. Thomas Jefferson saw there was no negotiating with Muslims, and he formed the Marines, and he attacked the Barbary pirates. We were talking about this a while back. And his response was, follow the Muslims back to their villages and killed every man, woman, and child in the village. Now, do you as an American Muslim still feel one of the oppressed? Absolutely not. I mean, certainly there's that sentiment. Uh, Jefferson was talking about the Barbary Wars. Uh, you know, as a Navy doc, my uh, Marines that I took care of talked about going from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, right? So that song was about the Tripolitan War that really had to do with the uh, Tripoli pirates uh, trying to exact... Uh, uh, um, they, they would steal our ships, and then we'd have to pay a ransom to get them back. So that ultimately uh, was the first contact the American military had with the uh, Muslim populations. But it's certainly, Jefferson also had a Quran. There are those who believe that Islam is not all about piracy and terrorism, but rather a Judeo-Christian ethic. Okay, anybody who didn't learn something from this hour, you can raise your hands now. <laughs> World Class Arizona with Pat McMahon, KTAR News on 92.3 FM.